Well, welcome to joy. Great day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Every day is, but we praise the Lord that we can come out and <clears throat> fellowship together and sing praises unto our God, and <clears throat> open up his word, and study together. It is a joy to have a part in that. We're in a series I've entitled Empowering Returns. We, uh, we're in Galatians, we're in the fruit of the Spirit, the investing in living fruit, and uh, it's from Galatians chapter number 5, verse 22 and 23. <clears throat> As we open up, though, the, <clears throat> the Scripture today, we want to understand that Jesus Christ's sacrifice and the Holy Spirit's indwelling, they guarantee unimaginably glorious things in our future. They are promised to us. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You know, he we talk about things, our future home, for example. Our home, as we approach that place, you have, to, you have to understand what it is. When you look upon that heavenly city, that holy city, Jerusalem, it says in Revelation 21 that the walls are of jasper, clear as crystal, that the foundations are made of 12 separate precious stones. It's going to be glorious to see. There's a wall around it that's 200 feet high, 1,500 miles long on each side. Each gate going into that city, each of the 12 gates, are made of a singular pearl. Now, the gates are never going to be closed. I'm not sure why there are gates in that respect. But can you imagine how big a gate is going to be in a 200-foot high by 1,500-mile wall? And each one made of an individual perfect pearl. There'll be angels guarding the gates. And as we enter into those gates, there'll be streets of purest gold. And they lead to these palatial mansions that are promised to each and every believer in the Scripture. But everyone is going to be drawn down that boulevard that is lined with tree of life. They give 12 different fruits throughout the year. And down the middle flows the river of life. How beautiful heaven must be. A place of perfection. Perfect beauty, perfect holiness, perfect unity, perfect joy. The absolute utopia that humans have desired since they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, right? And there will not be any tears, sickness, pain, death, sin, night, no judgment. It's going to be an amazing thing to experience. We'll get to see friends who have gone on before us. I think way back, my best friend had died when he was 16, Jimmy. I get to see him again. You know? We'll get to see our grandparents. I get to see my dad again. My in-laws, Paul and Nita boys, get to tell them how wonderful their baby girl, Jackie, grew up to be. What an awesome friend and mother and wife and leader and nurturer of so many. It will be a great day in heaven when we get to greet all those saints of old, the disciples and apostles that walked with Jesus. Old Testament prophet. I mean, everybody will be there that has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. But according to 1 Corinthians 2, 9, heaven will be more beautiful, more glorious 
infinitely so, then we can, with our greatest imagination, predict. It says greater than your dreams, than your imagination. But that's not all I'm looking forward to. You should be. Following that beautiful river <clears throat> up to the throne. Throne room is, de is described as having the throne high and lifted up in a rainbow, go a, an emerald rainbow completely encircling the throne. An innumerable company of angels all about. The beast singing, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. The saints singing, how great thou art to our God. Looking forward to seeing Jesus, whose radiance, I believe, outsigns the sun perfect and holy, the one who gave his life for me and for you, the one in whose righteousness I'm able to stand in that holy city to begin with. And as I fall on my face to worship him, as I believe everyone will, long to hear a voice the scripture says is the sound as of the sound of many waters. I've never been to Niagara Falls. Maybe you have. But I've stood in front of Victoria Falls, a place called the Smoke That Thunders. This amazing run. I'm thinking about how that, that just overwhelms everything else in its presence. And that will be the voice of our God speaking to us. And I dream of that voice, and I pray, desire, that he will say those words, well done, good and faithful. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. Now everything there except what he'll say to you or to me, guaranteed. Nobody, nothing can take any of that away from us who are believers in Jesus Christ. Guaranteed, absolutely certain. And as we study the power of investing in this living fruit into empowering returns, and that's what I really believe it is, we need to understand more about the fruit of the Spirit. But we also have to have our understanding grounded in the fact that God has already promised and it's as good as delivered all of those great and glorious things that he's promised us to come. No sin, no sickness, no tears, glorious place to dwell, the very presence of God Almighty and him speaking directly, verbally to each of us. Oh, wow. And it's guaranteed. So what are we worried about all the little things right now? We're not going to be here very long anyway compared to eternity. But this fruit of the Spirit, that is Galatians 5.22, I spoke about an introduction to it last week. All nine of these things are one fruit. It's the way it's written. It's the way it's translated. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is. Understand that in English. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If you will interact with people in this world even, with these as your guide, with these as your motivation, they're not going to have a problem with you. but we have to be able to stop trying to fix it all ourselves 
and trust that he's got us covered. For them that love him. Think about those words. What does love mean to God? I believe in order to understand what he's telling us, we need to understand what love is. For them that love him. And this love in our lives, this part of the fruit of the Spirit, how will the the, the fruit of the Spirit, of the love of the Spirit in our lives impact not our future, but our behavior today? We already know our future's in his hand and one day he will glorify us and we'll be perfect. We'll never be God, but we'll be perfect and we'll have all of these things. But today, in in our state that we're currently in, still living in this old body, still struggling with sin in our lives, how will this love look in our lives? How will it transform us, as the scripture tells us in, uh, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, and also when he says that we are predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, of Christ Jesus. So we need to know what this love looks like so we can identify it even in our own lives and we can recognize it as God is pouring it out upon us from himself. And one of the places we get that is from 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 uses the word agape. It's a a word translated love, but it is so big, so involved, so active that the translators translated it charity. It says that this love actually gets up and does something in somebody else's life. That's the kind of love we're talking about here. It says charity suffereth long. Charity is patient with other people. It's kind That's when you show yourself useful to somebody else, when you're kind to them, right? Charity envieth not. You're not overly desirous of your own return, of your own self. Charity vaunteth not itself. That's without boasting. If you have to tell somebody that what you're doing is love and they can't recognize it as love, it may not be love. is not puffed up or prideful, does not behave itself unseemly. That means never acting in an unbecoming way to someone. You can't mistreat someone and have it come across as love unless something happens in the mind, right? And that does happen to some. Seeketh not her own. That means it's not desiring to have worship because of this love is for their benefit. Right? It's not easily provoked. That means you don't get exasperated. You don't get angry easily. Now, you know, we were looking at uh, this anger on Wednesday night in the men's Bible study even. And the Bible says, be ye angry. Sin not. There are times to be angry. We need to be angry about sin. We need to be angry about our failures and things like that. Jesus got angry. You know, there were a couple of times in Scripture in that three and a half years, he got out the whips. He went into the church and he's throwing tables. You say, wait a minute, how can that be? But it was righteous anger. He was doing the right thing at the right time. When people tried to kill him, he didn't get angry with them and throw them out. He didn't kill them. When they disrespected his father's house, That's when he got angry. And he still did nothing wrong. He never, ever failed. Never went too far. Never was driven by the anger. It was a righteous response to a happening, and he just did what he was supposed to do. It says, thinketh no evil. Not keeping a negative list about people. How many times do we do that? We remember every single time they failed us. 
Whether they failed us or not, we took it as failure and we keep this list and it just keeps a barrier between us and them. It says, love doesn't do that. Love rejoices not in iniquity. It doesn't find joy in injustice or unrighteousness. It says, but it rejoices in truth. Taking joy in morality and righteousness. Seeing the transformation in people's lives. Beareth all things, willingly, patiently, and most often silently. Bearing one another's burdens. Believeth all things. Respectfully entrusting you, yourself, to someone. That's hard to do, especially if you've been hurt. And people hurt you all the time. And the more you minister, the more you'll find out they do it there too. You pour your life into people and then they spit it back in your face. They, they you know, abandon you and all that's going on. They abandon even the Lord. It's really hard to take. But you know what? Love says, I'm not going to take it out on them. I may have to move on, but okay, come back and we'll, we'll pick it up again. Hope with all things, a confident expectation that God really is in control, that God's going to make the difference. It may take a long time. We get frustrated with God's timetable. We get frustrated with God's methods sometimes, all that. But we have to trust enough, knowing what the future holds and who holds our future. We need to trust enough to be able to put it into his hands and just be who he wants us to be and do what he wants us to do. Endureth all things, perseveres in the struggles and the trials of life. It doesn't say you have to enjoy them, but you can't let it stop you. You can't let it stop you from from caring for other people and moving forward in your life. It even says charity, this love, never faileth. <clears throat> now, we're not Jesus. It doesn't work the same in our lives every time, okay? But we're supposed to look like Jesus. For those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, the Scripture says we are predestinated to be conceived formed to the image of Christ, the Son of God. We're supposed to be becoming more and more and more and more and more like Jesus. Real love, proper love, has power. It has power with God, no less. But it has power in our lives to make today and forever a better life than we're living. More glorious, more rewarding than we've ever dreamed. And I'm not just talking about the heavenly city, New Jerusalem right now. I'm talking about even today. As we are obedient, as we are loving, as God t tells us to love, when we stand in judgment, it'll be a better result, right? But in our own lives, don't you think we'll have a better relationship with people if we love them, truly love them, than if we're always putting up barriers, we're always putting them down, we're always pushing them away? You know, those things, that's not what Jesus did. When the crowds pressed in, Jesus didn't complain about that. When the crowds pressed in, he could have said, hey, don't you know who I am? Give me some room. But he didn't. The fruit of the Spirit, and this love in particular that we all understand. A lot of people preach love, but they don't necessarily live it. This power for living today. This Holy Spirit power and the fruit of the Spirit in our lives as we draw near unto Him, as we study the Word of God, as we follow His leading in all of these things, it is to change us. 
to transform who we are from the old sinful nature that we are to be putting away and we're to be putting on the new creation. And that's what the fruit of the Spirit does. It transforms who we are so that therefore what we do and how we react and the things that come out of our mouths are changed because of that. We're not saying disrespectful things. We're not putting out of our mouth unclean things. We're not, you know, tearing people up. We are building people up. We're not hating on people. We're drawing them toward Christ. All of these things. And we're not asking God with, to, without any involvement on our part to, hey, God, they need fixed. Why don't you fix them, God? That's not what we're doing here. Changed by love says, God, change me so that these people who need change can experience you through me. Right now, they don't know you. They don't know who you are. They don't know how to react when people say things. Their, their terminologies are all misunderstood. They have definitions for words that are contrary to yours. And so when we say love, they don't understand what we're saying. How are they going to understand it when the Holy Spirit works through you, works through me, and impacts their lives is the only way they're ever going to experience it. Because God is love. And until you experience God in your life, I'm telling you, you cannot truly experience love. You can experience infatuation. You can experience a, a strong like for something. You can experience a lot of things, but you can't experience what God is talking about here until you know God. As a believer, we not only know God, we have His Spirit within us, and it says that as we draw near to Him, as He works in us, the fruit of that Spirit being in us, a part of that transforms us into something that looks more like God so that people here on this earth can begin to experience Him. God has told us to be His light in this world. Right now, right here. Not to expect Him to do all the shining, not to expect Him to do all the connecting with people. But He put us here for that. When Jesus was on the earth, He said, I am the light of the world, but I'm going back to heaven. It's going to be your job to light the world. We're here as much as anything else to be the examples of what the Spirit in a person, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, drawing near to Him, what it looks like and what it does and the transforming power and all of the benefits that it has. And we're not just talking about love. We're talking about all the fruit of the Spirit and the joy and the peace and the long-suffering and the gentleness and the goodness and the faith and the self-control and all of these things in our lives, they're so supposed to show and how will the world recognize that we're not like the rest of the world? When we begin to let Jesus, let the Holy Spirit shine through us. Our problem is we're like the old oil lamp that gets all black and sooty you know, because we're all wrapped up in ourselves. We're all in, the, in our own mindset and life and trying to do for ourselves. And we don't really notice we're not shining very much. And we have to get rid of that in our lives. We have to die to self daily so that we can shine for Christ. And in that, as we get out of the way, so to speak, we can let them see the Jesus that is in us, the Holy Spirit that's in us. As long as we're thinking about self, as long as we're serving self, as long as it's all about me, they're not going to see any Jesus in us. The only light we have to give is Christ in us. And herein lies one of the greatest powers of God's love in the believer. You know, most of us, even as believers, do not fully understand the power of God's love. As I spoke of it earlier, or as it relates to the forgiveness of sin, you know, we have a tendency to overlook our own sin a lot of times. Minimize our sin. Put a magnifying glass on everybody else's. But God's love 
sent Jesus Christ to shed his blood to pay for every single one of our sins to pay the sin debt that we inherited from our father Adam. He did it all. He did it freely. He did it because of love. We certainly didn't earn it. And we don't even recognize how many times we sin against God. And yet he still forgives them. Even the ones we can't confess, right? Because we don't know them. Everlasting life. To comprehend the natural end to every human being is to spend fiery torment in hell because of our separation from God because of sin. To having that not only completely forgiven, but his justification put on our account and to be placed in a place of everlasting life where we would be in the presence of God forever and ever. And that began the day you got saved when the Holy Spirit came in. Never having to face any problem, any struggle, anything in your life ever again alone. The Holy Spirit's with you. Verse 25, Galatians 5. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? Very literally, that is Christ in us, driving our thoughts, driving our desires, uh, you know, transforming who we are by nature into who. He was in a very practical sense. And even though we do not wield the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God in the same way Jesus did, which is a good thing, because Jesus was perfect and we're not. You know, you've all seen some of those movies that they made where a human being got the power of God for a day or a week or something and how comical it was and how, you know, absurd. Well, that's just the way we humans might handle all power. Okay? So, we're not Jesus. And it's probably a good thing we can't wield the power of God like that. We get our feelings hurt. You know, the whole world might come to an end, right? But the only way we can shine to this world about Christ is because that Holy Spirit of God is within us. Not that we wield his power, but that we surrender to his will and his driving in our lives. That's how we shine. When we truly surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit's will, the Holy Spirit's plan and leading for our lives, we begin to experience the fruit of the Spirit in this practical sense. Enjoying the love of God for ourselves, yes, and the joy of the Lord and gentleness and self-control and all of these things. There are real benefits in our own life. We get to live with peace and joy even if the storm's brewing around us. That's a wonderful thing. Now, this it doesn't mean that all of the trouble and trials in your life are going to go away. No one shines, you know, no light shines as well uh, in the daylight as it does in the darkness. And so in the dark times of your life, is when people are going to recognize, wow, they still have peace. They still have joy. They don't like what's going on. They're not a fan of it. But they're not giving up on life. They're not giving up on God. They're not, they're not getting angry and losing control. And they haven't stopped loving me, even though the problems in their life may even be greater than the problems in my life. It is this power of God's love working in us that is the light of the world that Jesus actually commanded you to be. And the only way to do it is to let him shine in your life. 
You can't do that by serving yourself. You have to do that by serving Him. You can't do that by thinking you've got better answers to the problems in your life than God does. And you can't do that by only loving the people who love you back by, when it, as far as the love goes. We need to be able to love those. God tells us that we need to love those who mistreat us, those who are against us, those that are actually our enemies. That's not an easy thing to do. But he says it is that love, that active love that says I want to benefit everybody around me in some way even though they don't like me, even though they don't want what I have to give, even though you know all of these things are against us, it is that very love, the power of that, that not only transforms me and gives me peace, but also that has an impact on their lives. They actually benefit from knowing you and crossing your path in this world. That's who the Christian is supposed to be. He said, that's tough. Well, yeah, it's tough. That's why we have to be so close to God that we're not worried about ourselves. That's why we have to understand so fully that God's got us in his hands. Nothing can happen to us unless God allows it. And then we can let go and let God in our lives, right? This is the only way that an unsaved world that does not know God is ever going to be able to experience in any sense these great attributes of God, like love, you can't know love if you don't know God because God is love. We talk about that, all right? But how are they going to do that because they don't know God? They have to experience it through us. And then we have to let them know that the love they're experiencing when they begin to respond, it's not our love. It's just something we're able to pass on because God loved us. When we were yet sinners, when we were enemies of His, the power of the fruit of the Spirit in you and through you is only limited by your surrender to His leading in your life. Why is that? Because God is limitless. The Holy Spirit's God. And even though he won't give us necessarily all this power to do with it whatever we want, it still dwells within us, allows us to be transformed by it, and then we can reach others, believers and non-believers alike, family and friends and enemies and everybody else in our life. We can have an impact on them as we surrender to the Holy Spirit, and the, the more tightly we follow his leading... The more we get out of his way, the more he'll be able to accomplish in those around us as they experience God through us. We need to use the fruit of the Spirit. We need to, to dig in and, you know, I, I spoke last week <coughs> about how this word fruit actually has inherently in it the act of grasping it, of harvesting it, of taking it. Now, you don't take it by force, but you take it from the Holy Spirit. You work to make that connection, to get close to the Holy Spirit so that it comes into you. It is a benefit. That carpe, that carpe diem, remember, seize the day. That's what this fruit is, come, this word fruit comes from. Seizing it, harvesting it, taking it in, and what is fruit for? To benefit someone else. The fruit born by a tree or by a plant is not for itself. It's for others to benefit from. And so the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, it's not about the Holy Spirit. It's about the impact it has on us and the fruit that it will bear in us so that other people can receive the blessings of God in their own life. Fruit of the Spirit is a powerful, powerful thing. And I think we look at it and we think, oh, that's sweet, that's nice, love, joy, peace, I want all those things. It's not about just wanting them, it's about wanting to be a channel of blessing to others. Connecting with God in such a way 
Let everyone around you benefit. Being the light of the world because of the power of God in you and because of the change it brings in your life, the opportunity to give it to those around us. If you're here without Jesus today, if you don't know what it means to truly accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're not sure that you have done that, then you need to ask someone around you. You need to come forward and you know, contact someone if you're watching online, those kind of things. But you need Jesus. It all starts there. You don't have the Holy Spirit in your life until you have Jesus. Well, for those of us who are believers, we're supposed to be benefiting from the fruit of the Spirit and being a benefit to all those around us. Loving those around us in ways they've never experienced unless another believer's been in their life. That's who we are supposed to be. It's what it's all about. And I don't have to worry about today and I don't have to worry so much about tomorrow because God's got that all in His hands. What I need to be doing is drawing so close to Him, being so at peace with my relationship with Him that the Spirit of God can transform me and bless everyone around me. Heavenly Father, as we come before You, we pray, Lord, that You would work Your transforming work in us.